Welcome back. Now, coloured as an ethnicity and racial demographic is intertwined with the creation of today's South Africa. Yet often, coloured communities are disdained as people with no clear heritage or culture as not black enough or not white enough. Well, coloured by uh, Tessa Dooms and Ninzi uh, Ebony Shutal challenges uh, this notion and presents a different angle to that narrative. It dwells into the history of coloured people as descendants of indigenous Africans and a people whose identity was shaped by colonisation, slavery and the racial political hierarchy it created. Well, the two co-authors are here to tell us more about it. Ladies, good morning. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you for having me. Tessa, let me start with you. How did this idea come about of putting together this book? Yeah, it wasn't our idea. Mm -hmm. So um, it came from an unfortunate um, occurrence. Mm -hmm. So I um, in 2020, Nathaniel Julie's 16-year-old um, boy was murdered by the yes. police in El Dorado Park. Mm -hmm. And as that was unfolding, um, both Lindsay and I, because of the spaces that we occupy, particularly in the media, mm. found ourselves having to explain to people why coloured people were angry mm. and why coloured people are, you know, always having to feel like they have to defend themselves mm. and have to feel like, you know, they're not, as you say, in the centre of South African life. Mm. And I really was, I was struck by it because I don't think I realised just how much people misunderstood right. um, coloredness and the struggles of coloured communities. And so during that period, um, the publisher contacted us and asked um, if we would write this. And we decided to do it, I think mm. primarily because we wanted to tell the stories of coloured communities. Mm. Often the conversation about coloredness ends up at this conversation about the legitimacy of the word coloured. Yes. And we wanted to go beyond that and say, beyond this word and this classification, there's these communities of people across the country that have real lives, real stories, and real shared sense and experiences um, with each other. And that's what makes coloured identity legitimate, not mm. just the classification. Mm. I mean, let's uh, talk about... so. You're approached by this person. Where do you guys start? There's so much uh, history. There's so much there. I think the first place we started was how we wanted this book to come across. Mm. And what we were very clear about is that we didn't want an academic book. Right. This is not going to be an ethnography. It's not going to be an anthropology. What it is going to be is a story, the book about real stories, mm. a book about how colored culture is shaped by the people's stories. And so my favorite thing about this book is that on the cover, the people that you see are real people. Yes. They're not stock images. They're the stories of the people in there. And so when Tessa and I sat down to plan it, uh, my favorite part, she fed me pancakes. Um, yeah. And my favorite part about this is that we said, well, when we look at what elements make up culture, yeah. it's language, it's food, it's music, but it's also how we express ourselves in terms of gender, identity, masculinity, and femininity. And then that age-old question, which becomes a chapter, mm. which is, is Trevor Noah colored? Yes. <laughs> <He's not. laughs> <He's not. laughs> exactly right and so and those are the things that people ask over and over about colored culture but in telling that we focused on real people and real stories and that's why i'm so proud of this and i want to talk about why there's the, the complexity why that complexity exists why do we even find ourselves in this situation yeah so i mean in the intro when you're talking about not black enough not white mm. enough that's part of the problem with the complexity. Yeah. I think that colored is a mis misnomer. It's, mm. mis it's not a race, yes. right? Race is about biology and phenotypes and how you appear and how mm. you look. And coloredness really just isn't that in a, as a lived experience. Yes. Um, a, an African-American person on TikTok was asking, yes. how do Simone. colored people yeah. end... No, no, not even Simone, yeah. somebody else mm. on the back of that. But how do colored people end up looking so different, right? Yes. And that's because the way in which colored communities come together is actually through various paths. Yes. Some people come because of the indigenous ancestry of the Khoi and the San. Mm. Some people come because of the slave history of the Malay slaves coming through Dutch colonization. Mm. Some people come to being colored through, like with my, in my case, my great-great-grandfather was a German soldier who came here and married a, um, a Tswana woman. Yes. So some people come to it in very, very different ways. Mm. And so you don't have a biology that is the same, a lineage that's the same, that, or a history that's the same. What you do have is an impact of colonialism and apartheid that is the same. Yes. A treatment of us that says, you know, we don't know what to do with you, so we're just going to clump everybody mm. together. Mm. And in the process, 
um, as colored people, we have responded by creating culture because we were put together. Yes. And we had to find each other. And so we're not the same because of the same bloodlines that we hold. Mm -hmm. We're the same because we created community and culture despite the violence of apartheid and slavery. Mm -hmm. And we touched on the, well, the recent case now on TikTok of the lady who doesn't quite understand, doesn't quite grasp, you know, what color is and their meaning of color. And is that maybe part of the reason there is so much confusion as well? There's the, there's not the complexities exist is because of how our history and the American history exists. Do you think that contributes to the, the complexities that come with being colored? Well, I think for one thing with being colored is that we're not telling you to call yourself colored. Yes. And that because the word itself is such a heavy word, right? And we understand that in the United States, it's a slur. But what we're also saying is that we have the agency as people in South Africa to decide what we're going to call ourselves. And our history is not their history. We, what we do share, and we always say this, is that we are ethnically colored and politically black. Mm -hmm. And our political blackness comes from a shared experience of oppression. And it's an experience that we share with the Americans as well. And with people from the Caribbean and people from the United Kingdom and all peoples who have lived under colonialism and enslavement. And so in that sense, yes, you know, we, I can understand where the contestation comes in. Yes. But then it comes back to the idea of what you get to call yourself. And that's where uh, power and agency comes yes. in. Now, what we're not saying is that everybody who is so-called born, born into a colored community or is or seen as colored... Or is given Exactly. Yeah. Mm. We're not asking you to hold up a banner and flag it around. What we're saying to you is to think through it and then decide and to think through your history and your culture yes. and to think through the fact that in spite of all this pain, in spite of enslavement, in spite of colonialism, in spite of what the Group Areas Act did to our families, which is to literally rip them apart. As in spite of all of that, we've created something to celebrate here. Mm -hmm. And so what we ask is that once you've made it through, you can then decide thereafter. But you have to decide the course. You have a very difficult history of being almost erased from yes. this country. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why. There's a push to have, you know, a, a recognition of the other side in the core of the First Nations. But that doesn't explain the entire color history. Just as said, we've got a, his a history that comes from across the South African story. And so what we're asking is just to think, when you use the word colored, and I personally have come to, after, particularly after I see the have really come to, in, like, embrace Okay, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to um, yeah. cut you short there because I, I believe your mic is gone. I'm oh. going to try and fix that for you while we try and continue with uh, Tessa here. I mean, I want to speak about the highlights of putting this book together and, you know, which uh, part of it were you saying, oh, I didn't even know that, you know, what were the lessons that came with it? So luckily, because we were writing different chapters, I yeah. think I learned a lot from Lindsay's yes. chapters particularly. And so, I um, mean, Lindsay's also a, more of a historian than I am. Yes. So just kind of, kind of looking at things like um, the creation of food in colored identity. So we talk a lot about the cook sister. Yeah. So, um, you know, white Afrikaners have a thing they call a cook sister. Yeah. I deny that it is <laughs> one because <laughs> what I grew up calling a cook sister or in the Cape what they call a cook sister yeah. um, is this little um, dough ball. Mm -hmm that is flavorful and has cinnamon and nutmeg and all sorts of flavor yes. in it um, and it's coated in, in um, coconut yes but we went back and looked at the history of that okay um, you know the the Malay slaves that created that as a way to do to do a throwback to their heritage from being in Indonesia mm. and bringing that with them mm. into the, the the modern or the into the new place they found themselves as slaves yeah and even looking at things like like language and music and understanding that what colored people were doing, and this, this was not a, a happy moment for us, probably one of the saddest moments for us, right. is once we read each other's chapters, that realizing when we were creating culture, it was often a response to pain. The pain of being away from home mm. causes you to bring the smells and the tastes of home yes. into the slave kitchen that you are in. Um, the idea of not having um, a shared sense of identity, uh, even in the, in the face of pain, mm. creates music and music that is very somber and music that is about triumph and trying to struggle through things. Um, creates religion and the use of religion. I speak about the story of my mother who used religion as a way to find culture when she was displaced from her own culture. And so we see all of these stories of overcoming or confronting pain by creating a shared culture. Mm -hmm. The Group Areas Act, we always yes. talk about the classification, but the Group Areas Act is even mm -hmm. a bigger part of the colored story because the way in which the communities come together is that classification turns into, now mm -hmm. we are taking you away from your families. Yeah. We are removing you. My father wasn't allowed to live with his family because part of his family was classified as native. Mm -hmm. And he actually got arrested 
for working in the family store. Mm. That's the mm. kind of thing that we're talking about, that colored people came together and despite pain, created culture that is recognizable. So we often say that um, one of the things that we are pushing back against in this book mm. is the annoying idea that colored people have no culture. Yes. Even mm. if it's a contemporary culture, it still matters. Mm. Even if I can't trace my lineage 500 years, it's okay. Yeah. Because who I am right now and what we've created together still matters. All right, ladies, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. you for coming uh, this morning, uh, talking to us about a book. I said, The moment I saw it, I said to Sakina, we ha they have to come. They have to. They have to come. <laughs> Sociologist, political analyst and development uh, practitioner Tessa Dooms, as well as multimedia journalist and writer uh, Lindsay Shutal talking to us about their book. It's titled Coloured.